Okay. A uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our next lecture in the PG Psychiatry Knowledge Series. Uh, the topic for today being neurology masquerading as psychiatry: a potential reversible psychosis. Insight into autoimmune encephalitis. Uh, for that, we of course have our moderator, Dr. Karishma Rupani, who will be joining us very, very shortly. Uh, Dr. Karishma Rupani is an assistant professor at the Department of Psychiatry, KEM Hospital, and Saint GS Medical College. Uh, I've had the pleasure of uh, working with her when she was an assistant professor at Sion Hospital. So she's very adept in her knowledge. She has done a lot of research. And uh, she has over 30 to 40 publications to her credit. And uh, she's, of course, one of the most down to earth people I met. So uh, she will be here soon. She's trying to join in. And then she'll probably moderate the session. And I will be back in the end to say the final thank yous. Uh, our speaker for today is uh, Dr. Ashutosh Shah. Dr. Ashutosh Shah is a consultant psychiatrist at Dr. H.D. Gandhi Hospital and Sir so HN Reliance Foundation Hospital, where I've had the pleasure of having him as a very fond colleague. Uh, Dr. Ashutosh Shah is also very important because he is uh, one of the most neurobiologically informed psychiatrists we have in our city today. And I always look up to him when I'm stuck in neurobiology. His understanding of certain things has always impressed me. And I'm sure he will, you know, add a lot of light to this topic, which baffles a lot of psychiatrists, including me. So I think without wasting time, we'll hand over to Ashutosh so that he can take over. And then we'll, in the end, whatever questions you have, you can keep typing in the chat box and Karishma will moderate that in the end. Yeah. Over to you, Ashutosh. Thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Avinash. I think uh, you have been very kind with me always, introducing me in a very, very positive light. Uh, so let me start. I'll just share my screen. Okay. Uh, things visible for you all? Is my screen visible? Yes, sir. Okay, so let me just minimize this. So let me start out with a clinical case. Uh, so this will set a tone for the talk. So for this case, this case we had a 40 year old male who came with a questionable brief febrile illness two months before the current presentation. And then there was an onset of, abrupt onset of altered behavior. So this altered behavior included talking irrelevantly, not sleeping, appearing anxious, getting annoyed and angry intermittently, uh, behaving in a socially inappropriate fashion. So the wife would say he would demand sexual favors in front of the family. And this was something which had never happened in the past. The son also corroborated that he had his, saw that his father was having memory lapses. And this gentleman had documented, so a medical doctor had examined that he had ataxia, transient aphasia, and diplopia. And then subsequently, this altered behavior had increased. And this gentleman never had any past history of psychiatric illness or substance use disorder. And when I examined him, he was not cooperating. He was sweating. He was giving irrelevant answers, singing spontaneously. His attention was really fluctuating. He was anxious. He gave paranoid ideas, not very well-formed delusions, but paranoid ideas. He had absent insight and an impaired judgment. On the EEG, there was no abnormality detected. And the MRI showed certain hyper-intense lesions in different parts of the brain, which have been listed on the slide. And then subsequently, the serum anti-NMDA receptor antibody was positive. And this gentleman responded to immunotherapy. So this is a very concise history that I'm presenting. And what I would like you all to observe over here is, Somebody starts off with typical psychiatric and behavioral symptoms, has certain neurological findings, and then we find this person has a serum anti-NMDA receptor antibody positive and responds to immunotherapy. So this prompted the whole topic today, which is essentially autoimmune encephalitis, which is a potentially reversible psychosis and truly speaking, a neuropsychiatric disorder presenting as a typical psychiatric illness. So I'm Dr. Ashtosh and I'll be taking you all over the next 25, 30 minutes, giving you all some insights into what is this autoimmune encephalitis and what is the underlying pathophysiology. Not focusing too much 
on the treatment and you will know why because the treatment is essentially a multidisciplinary team as a stand alone psychiatrist it's not possible to treat these patients so let's go to the next slide and in the given case when does one suspect autoimmune encephalitis so herken and press have given certain red flags and yellow flags so there are six red flags and 10 yellow flags which i'm going to show you all which should make you all think that the presenting case could be a potentially autoimmune encephalitis case so the first red flag is a csf pleocytosis lymphocytic pleocytosis that means a cell count more than 5 per millimeter cube or a csf specific oligoclonal band without evidence for infection so usually in the beginning of autoimmune encephalitis one would get the lymphocytic pleocytosis and as the illness progresses there is a possibility to get a oligoclonal band this happens usually in 90% of the cases not 100% of the times second red flag is a person getting an epileptic seizure specifically somebody who never had a seizure in the past gets a first time episode of epileptic seizure or a facio brachial dystonic seizure so by this term facio brachial dystonic seizure it's nothing but a abnormal involuntary movement of the upper limb and the ipsilateral face so both of them are moving up and actually if you do a knee here can i just request the audience to mute themselves please and if you do an eeg at that point in time you would not see any epileptic activity but if you do a emg you will get a myokinetic activity the fourth red flag is a suspected neuroleptic malignancy syndrome if this happens please think if the individual has an autoimmune encephalitis the fifth one are mri abnormalities usually mesiotemporal intensities or an atrophic pattern and the sixth red flag is definitely eeg abnormalities either a generalized lowing or an epileptic activity or an extreme delta brush so when i say extreme delta brush it's nothing but a fast beta activity superimposed on a background of slow delta waves so a delta wave with a serrated appearance that's what you see but this is usually in just roughly around 30% of the cases so not everybody has these kind of eeg findings so any time the person has any of these red flags think there's a possibility the person could be having an autoimmune encephalitis the yellow flags so there are 10 yellow flags the first one being a decreased level of consciousness or a fluctuating sensorium which was the case in the first slide that i showed the individual has a delirium like picture the second one is abnormal postures or movements either orofacial dyskinesias or limb dyskinesias and often one would think that it's related to the underlying treatment however it is jolly well a feature of the illness itself the third one is autonomic instability either the pulse is there is tachycardia or bradycardia or blood pressure is not stable either hypertension or hypotension and there is sweating so in the case that i presented there was intense sweating that's a symptom of autonomic instability the fourth one is a new focal neurological deficit in the case that i showed there was ataxia and also diplopia and aphasia or dysarthria so the person had speech difficulties as well a rapid progression of psychosis so an abrupt onset and a very rapid progression despite whatever treatment you give and hyponatremia if this is present please do also suspect encephalitis other than all the other causes of hyponatremia in conjunction with other yellow flags as well as red flags or catatonia either mutism vaxi flexibility or posturing all these could happen and headaches as well as if you find a autoimmune disease like a thyroiditis please don't think this is another disorder it could jolly well be the same component of the autoimmune encephalitis so having seen this six red flags and 10 yellow flags let's see what exactly is encephalitis so the definition is it's an inflammation of the brain parenchyma and when it involves the meninges it's called meningoencephalitis and if it involves the spinal cord it's called myelomeningoencephalitis now the definition as per the 
International Encephalitis Consortium requires an evidence of a fever. Sorry, mental status change lasting more than a day. That's a major criterion along with two minor criteria. One is fever, either three days before or after the presentation, along with generalized or partial seizures, which are not attributable to a pre-existing seizure disorder or a new onset of focal neurologic findings or a lymphocytic a CSF pleocytosis or an abnormality of the brain parenchyma on neuroimaging or EEG not ascribable to other causes. So you need to have an altered mental state lasting more than a day, along with at least two of these minor criterion out of this five, any two. And if that is the case, it's a possible diagnosis. If you have three or more, it becomes a probable or confirmed diagnosis. So do pay attention that these criteria are heavily skewed towards the infective etiology. In fact, it's only in the last 15 years that the field of autoimmune neuropsychiatry is coming up. Otherwise, the causes of encephalitis in half the cases one could never find. But whatever that you found were mainly attributable either to bacteria, viruses, or fungi, or parasites. Now, increasingly over the last decade plus, there is lots and lots of literature coming in about an autoimmune pathology. So this brings us to the topic of autoimmune encephalitis. This is not new. In fact, way back in the 1960s, limbic encephalitis was first described. So when we say limbic system, we're essentially talking of anterior thalamus, the hypothalamus, the cingulate cortex, the amygdala, and the hippocampus. These are the chief structures constituting the limbic system. And the main job of the limbic system is memory, behavior, and emotions. So if there's an inflammation of these areas, that would result in memory loss, confusion, and agitation. And this was described way back in the 60s. Even autoimmune encephalitis was described, if you trace back the literature, in the 70s. But it was for the very first time in 2005 that a neurologist from Barcelona, Spain, Dr. Joseph Dalmo, identified the anti-NMDA receptor as being a specific antibody subtype leading and causing the autoimmune encephalitis. And thereafter, there has been an explosion. In fact, there's a specific website dedicated to autoimmune encephalitis. And every once in a while, a new antibody is always getting discovered. So it's an evolving field. Now the immunological mechanisms, if we look broadly, we can divide it into three things. I'm just going to go very superficially over here. Don't worry on the right side. You will see lots and lots of strange names over here. What I would like you all to focus is over here. So the mechanisms, the production of antibodies can be against intracellular antigens. That means the structures inside the cell membrane. And essentially, these target the mRNA transcription factors. So all this who, ma2, Glutamic acid decarboxylase. Well, technically, glutamic acid decarboxylase is an enzyme involved, but these ANA1, et cetera, are the ones which are involved in transcription. And antibodies, when we say technically over here, is the activated CD8 T cell, which does the damage. The antibody is more to diagnose this condition. Whereas the antibodies are against the cell synaptic receptor or the ion channels or surface proteins. This is where the antibodies, which are secreted by the activated T cell, would do a direct damage. So you have over here NMDA, GABA receptor, AMPA, the metabotrophic glutamic receptor, as well as the LGI1, Casper2, et cetera. But what I will be focusing on is the NMDA receptor. So the antibody against this receptor, N-methyl D aspartate. Why? A, this is the most common cause of autoimmune encephalitis. Secondly, this case, so in this particular presentation, 90% of the time, the individuals have predominant psychiatric symptoms to begin with. And 80% of the time, this patients first come to a psychiatrist. In fact, 40% of them are also admitted in psychiatric wards. And it's very crucial for the psychiatrist to realize that they are not dealing with a de novo primary psychiatric disorder. It's actually an autoimmune encephalitis.
the rest of the cases over here, the other antibody cases, they will have predominant neurologic symptoms, seizure. So they are less likely to come first to a psychiatrist. They would usually be referred to a neurologist straight away. So coming to NNT, NMDA receptor autoimmune encephalitis. So this will be the top year after in my presentation. The estimated incidence is roughly 1.5 per million population per year. So here do note, it's an estimated incidence. The real one could be more than this, but even if we look at whatever the number, it's still a rare disorder. So then if it's a rare disorder, why did I choose this topic? Well, as I said, most of the people do come with psychiatric or behavioral symptoms. It's really difficult to differentiate from a primary psychiatric disease. There's a predominance of females, median age of presentation being 21 years, but cases reported in infants as young as eight months and elderly as old as 85 years. And this is where the good part is, 80% of the patients, 70 to 80% improve or recovered once the correct treatment, which is immunotherapy is given, or if there was underlying tumor, when the tumor is removed. So early treatment, no admission to intensive care unit were predictors of good outcome. And these two are chiefly the reasons why the psychiatrist should not miss out, even if this is a rare pathology. And usually the disease is monophasic. So it happens and then it recovers nothing else. It doesn't relapse. In roughly 12 to 25% of the cases, there can be a relapse in the first two to three years, but this is a less severe compared to the initial episode. So therefore the importance of this identification of what is autoimmune encephalitis, because there's a really good prognosis if it is caught on early and given the right treatment by the correct doctor, which is by and large the neurologist. So in terms of autoimmune encephalitis, as I said, anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis is the most common cause. Essentially, it's the IDG antibody against the excitatory NMDA receptor. This is the one which is doing the damage. So you know the NMDA receptor is an excitatory receptor in the CNS. Now, the antibodies are formed against the NR1 subunit. So this is the unit which is outside the cell membrane. And this is where the antibody actually binds and alters the synaptic function in the limbic system, basal ganglia, and brainstem. And therefore, the function of these structures, the limbic system, basal ganglia, and brainstem is altered. So the job of the limbic system is control the mood, emotions, and behavior. And therefore, you will get abnormal behavior, confusion, psychotic paranoid ideations. And basal ganglia is essentially in movements. So therefore, you will get perioral movements or various dyskinesias or even in certain cases, seizures. And brainstem is involved chiefly in the autonomic nervous system. So hyperventilation and other autonomic symptoms would be. So this is where I'm trying to corroborate the brain structures involved, the postsynaptic receptor, the NMDA receptor, the NR1 subunit, and that malfunctions when the antibodies attached to it. And the most common psychiatric symptoms in those more than 12 years of age would be psychosis, agitation, catatonia, mood changes, and anxiety. But in children less than 12 years of age, the most common symptom is actually agitation, followed by psychosis and catatonia, less of mood change and anxiety. Now, there is a reason why this difference in the symptom profile. And if anybody is interested, they can ask me in the QA why there's a difference between the adults and children in terms of the presentation. And because of these prominent behavioral abnormalities, the psychiatrist is definitely the person who is consulted first by the patient or they are referred to the psychiatrist. And when psychiatrists give them the neuroleptics, they do not tolerate. They really have a problem tolerating the neuroleptics. And then quickly the picture evolves. So what happens? The person gets movement disorders, may get chorea or dystonic movement, seizures, focal deficits, speech impairment, and then it worsens. There can even be a coma and a fatal outcome in this case. So the time chart of evolution is somebody gets a viral flu-like illness a week before, a week later, presents with typical psychiatric symptoms of behavior disturbances and psychosis for a week or two, 
and then evolves into a neurological complication over weeks and months. And then if it is correctly recognized and treated with immunotherapy, picture improves. However, there's a possibility to have executive dysfunctions, impulsivity, personality changes, and sleep abnormalities, and explain you all why that can happen. So here, what is happening is this NMDA receptor antibody, after it binds, it does not have the complement. The complement doesn't bind over here. What it does is it lowers the surface density of the NMDA receptor on the postsynaptic neuron. So there is a certain amount of density you need of these receptors for the NMDA receptor to do the job well in the brain. And the job of the NMDA receptor is mainly involved in long-term potentiation in synaptic plasticity. And long-term potentiation is involved in memory. And the maximum density of NMDA receptors in the brain is in the hippocampus and amygdala. And therefore, when it malfunctions, you will have dysfunction of the hippocampi, cognitive problems, and whenever amygdala is involved, you will get anxiety symptoms. So this is a nice graphical display as to how this antibody is formed. So you have a neuron which is infected with a virus, usually a herpes simplex virus, and then it is presented to an antigen presenting cell or an ovarian teratoma, which can have an MDA receptor like antigen. So what we call molecular mimicry. And this antigen presenting cell goes to the local lymph nodes where it's presented to the T cells, which then activate the B cell. And the B cell either is activated within the CNS or it crosses the blood CSF or the blood brain barrier. Or the antibodies also can be formed in the periphery and then they translocate to the CSF or into the brain parenchyma. Usually the blood brain barrier will not allow these antibodies to enter, except when there's an inflammation. And when they do enter, they go and bind to the synaptic and the extrasynaptic NMDA receptor. And then what do they do? So when they attach, they impair the neuronal firing as well as they disturb the interaction of this NMDA receptors with a tyrosine kinase, efferin type 2 receptor. And this leads to excess levels of glutamate and excitotoxicity. So what happens? So over here, you see in the presynaptic vesicle, there is glutamate. And this is the postsynaptic NMDA receptor. And this is the antibody which is bound at the NMDA receptor site. And this is the site where glycine binds. Usually, when this antibody is bound, this receptor does not function. There is excitotoxicity toxicity essentially induced by an unchecked flow of calcium. So an excitotoxic cellular damage will happen. And if this is not corrected, so the antibody, if they are not suppressed or removed, the density does not recover. But if the antibody is rapidly suppressed or removed, the synaptic density recovers and the patients improve significantly, almost completely. So it's important. Time is of essence in these cases. So because chronic exposure to the antibody would result in an irreversible neuronal death, which can be seen as brain atrophy on MRI imaging. And these anti NMDA receptor antibodies, the encephalitis, is usually associated with ovarian teratomas following herpes simplex virus encephalitis. And there is some evidence, though not very robust, about particular HLA allele types. So this was the pathophysiology. Now, how do we diagnose this condition? So we need to have an antibody, neuronal antibody testing, which usually is a cell-based assay. So either the patient's CSF or the serum, the sample is collected and its reactivity against a particular cell line is tested, either a fixed or a live cell. Majority of the laboratories around the world use a fixed cell. Very few actually do a live cell. But there's a point you all need to keep in mind that roughly around 2 to 14% of the population would have the antibody not the IgG, but the IgA or the IgM type of antibody. And that can give rise to a false positive. So these people do not have any other symptom of autoimmune encephalitis. And this can be obviated if you use a CSF sample. Of course, if you are using a serum sample, then one needs to do a confirmatory test, a brain immunostaining. So it's best if a CSF sample is used together with a serum sample. So let's see what are the diagnostic criteria. 
So the diagnostic criteria as given by Dr. Dalma, a probable criteria is a rapid onset in the last three months of four of six major group of symptoms, either an abnormal behavior or a speech dysfunction, seizures, movement disorder, decreased level of consciousness or autonomic dysfunction. So any four of these six together with one lab finding, either an abnormal EEG or an abnormal CSF, along with exclusion of other causes of encephalitis, like herpes simplex encephalitis or Japanese B encephalitis, etc. And if there is a systemic teratoma which is identified, you just need three group of symptoms instead of four. So that gives you a probable diagnosis. But for a definite diagnosis, one needs to have one or more of these six group of symptoms over here, plus demonstration of IgG antibodies against the N1 receptor and the NMDA receptor, preferably in the CSF, and exclusion of the history of HSV or Japanese B encephalitis or any other cause which is leading to the immune encephalitis. So this was the diagnostic criteria. So, so far we have seen, first of all, what are the red flags, the six red flags, the 10 yellow flags, when one should suspect autoimmune encephalitis. Then you all have seen what is the definition of encephalitis, what is autoimmune encephalitis, and what is the underlying pathophysiology, followed by the diagnostic criteria, and how do you diagnose autoimmune encephalitis using a cell-based assay technique. So next, in reality, how does one go about? So there is this paper released last year, which actually has an SOP, which one can use to go about systematically making an accurate diagnosis in the suspected autoimmune encephalitis. So whenever on history or clinical symptoms, if you find all these features or any of these features, suspect autoimmune encephalitis. So the red flags and the yellow flags, if there is a suspicion, then investigate the patient. And by investigation, essentially it's EEG, CSF and MRI. So you will appreciate that there is a cost. These are not cheap investigations and definitely in an acute psychotic state, getting the patient to have an EEG or a CSF or an MRI is also a challenge. But get these done if at all feasible. And mind you, all these three investigations can be normal and yet the person can still have autoimmune encephalitis. MRI can only be abnormal in 50%. So 50% of the times you may not get any abnormalities in the MRI. The CSF may be abnormal in 90%, but in 10% it may not be abnormal. EEG may be abnormal only in 30 to 40% of the cases. Does not mean the person does not have autoimmune encephalitis. And of course, in all this, as well as if you don't suspect autoimmune encephalitis, you need to look for alternative causes, other viral causes of encephalitis, neuromyelitis optica, multiple sclerosis, acute demyelinating encephalomyelitis, toxins, vasculitis, prion disease, meningitis. So you'll appreciate as psychiatrists, we may not be fully competent to diagnose these de novo neurological conditions. So therefore the importance of involving a neurologist early on, right on when you suspect a autoimmune encephalitis in your cases, because these will need a multidisciplinary approach, a team approach to manage these cases. Now, having sent the EEG, CSF, MRI, and then still the suspicion is there, do an antibody test, a serum, preferably a CSF sample. And if the report is positive, that means an antibody is detected and it's compatible with the clinical syndrome, then of course, depending on whether it's a surface antibody or an intracellular, what we call the onconeural antibody, a diagnosis of definite autoimmune encephalitis or a definite paraneoplastic syndrome would be made. If the person presents with typical evidence of paraneoplastic syndrome, either a limbic encephalitis, cerebellar degeneration, opsoclonus, myoclonus, or encephalomyelitis, do a tumor screening, do an MRI, and if you find MRI abnormalities, a tumor screen is positive, and the antibody also is positive. This is a definite limbic encephalitis. Now, sometimes you may not get a serum or a CSF antibody present, but you still have an ongoing suspicion that the person seems to be having autoimmune encephalitis. There is an option to send the sample 
to a research lab which can do more an antibodies testing and even test for newer antibodies and then if the result is positive you have a diagnosis of probable autoimmune encephalitis but if the research lab also turns out negative nothing is found and the clinical suspicion still remains strong this is something what we call the antibody negative autoimmune encephalitis but if there is the clinical suspicion thereafter is not strong then we can make a diagnosis that it is not autoimmune encephalitis or right in the beginning if the clinical suspicion is not there then look for the alternative causes now what do you do so you have a probable autoimmune encephalitis or a definite autoimmune encephalitis or even sometimes antibody negative autoimmune encephalitis then the therapy and what therapy will this be three broad things symptomatic or a immune therapy or a tumor removal therapy so in terms of the immune therapy your importance is early therapy and the first line therapy consists of either methylprednisolone or plasma pharesis or intravenous immunoglobulins i have listed the doses the duration i am not going into details because this is something much beyond the competence of day to day psychiatrist and we would definitely not be doing this on our own please involve a neurologist because if you give a methylprednisolone in somebody who does not have autoimmune encephalitis who has an infective etiology the person will really worsen and possibly a fatal outcome will happen so do not get adventurous by seeing the presentation today that from tomorrow you would be competent enough to treat this cases please involve a neurologist even an oncologist immunologist if indicated or an onco surgeon or a rheumatologist and a nephrologist because these treatments would necessitate an icu facility and a lot of multidisciplinary approach now despite this first line therapy if there is no effect two weeks later then a second line therapy exists which is usually rituximab or cyclophosphamide i'm not going into details what doses side effects whether to monitor cd8 count etc that is much beyond the competence of everyday psychiatrist there are also other treatments like mycophenolate mofetil methotrexate azathioprine as well as promising new drugs like bortezomib tocilizumab or even an autologous stem cell transplant one point is if the antibody titers are persistently high in parallel to ongoing symptoms then a repeated plasma pharesis should also be considered and of course this is usually a monophasic that means you give a treatment often for a period of 1 to 3 years and then that can be stopped now between the different first line therapies second line therapies comparative studies are very few so you don't have any hard and fast guidelines to say okay one should first give only methylprednisolone or only as a thiopurine or whatever so some centers actually use rituximab as a first line treatment but that is they are specializing in this domain it's not done by the psychiatrist what is important is early initiation of immunotherapy and that will only happen if the psychiatrist had thought about nmda receptor antibody autoimmune encephalitis and called on his friendly neighborhood neurologist to help manage this case remember it's not only the acute phase but even the long term treatment the outcome depends on early initiation of immunotherapy and there can be persistent cognitive deficit specifically if the excitotoxic cell damage develops into neuronal death in the hippocampus there will be persistent cognitive deficit so all the more important time is of essence and therefore the presentation today to sensitize the psychiatric community about this particular pathology when to suspect and what to do after you are suspected and to correlate the clinical picture with the underlying pathophysiology now the other thing is if there is a tumor then removal of the tumor is definitely indicated and therefore the involvement of an oncologist or a onco surgeon and the symptomatic therapy so this is where i'll describe a little bit not much on the slide more in my talks so in terms of symptomatic therapy from a psychiatric perspective one thing is the patients do not tolerate neuroleptics before you start the immunotherapy the funny part is if you give it in concurrence with the immunotherapy patients will tolerate the 
different neuroleptics. Now, there is no guideline which antipsychotic to use. Sorry, there is no guideline which antipsychotic to use. Use whatever antipsychotics you all are familiar with and whichever that suits the symptom presentation at that point in time. If the person has predominant manic symptoms, one could even give valproate or lithium in these cases. Just one word of warning, if the person has catatonic symptoms, we know that such an individual will respond well to lorazepam or a benzodiazepine. But just be warned that because hypoventilation can be part of the syndrome itself, giving a benzodiazepine, you can further depress the respiratory drive and that can be problematic. So be very careful when you are using lorazepam in the catatonic patients. Anti-epileptic therapy, of course, would be required. Again, it's symptomatic. Once the acute phase is over, the doses would be tapered. Same goes with antipsychotic drugs. These also would need to be tapered once the initial disease phase is controlled. And if there is a status epilepticus or severe autonomic symptoms or major behavioral abnormalities, such an individual would need a intensive care unit treatment, possibly even sedation and mechanical ventilation. And finally, if the person recovers from the acute stage, this person will also need physiotherapy and speech therapy to help improve the overall outcome. Now, there are certain prognosticating factors and this paper published in 2019 by Broadly et al. would be helpful. So what they have tried to figure out is all these variables over here, they have tried to find out which one is associated with a poor outcome in the anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis. And three things actually stand out, which I'm highlighting. A use of immunotherapy, if not done, that is likely to result in a poor outcome of NNT and MDA receptor encephalitis. A delay in immunotherapy. So when I say delay, usually if you are able to get things moving in the first six weeks of the onset of symptoms, you really have a better prognosis. But longer the delay, the likelihood that there's a permanent neuronal death and that leads to a less favorable prognosis. And if there is an ICU admission, again, the prognosis is then less better versus the one who does not need an ICU admission. Overall, majority of the people improve. I said 70 to 80% have almost complete recovery, but this takes time. It may take even up to a year to two years for this to happen. Few may not have a full recovery and roughly three to 4% may have a fatal outcome. So therefore, this needs to be kept in mind that try and detect it as early as possible. Involve the right team members from other specialties to have the correct use of immunotherapy. And if an ICU admission is not to, uh, or is avoided, then the outcome is much better. So to conclude and to recap the whole talk, A, in patients with the six red flags and the 10 yellow flags, think autoimmune encephalitis as a cause. Do a standard diagnostic workup, EEG, MRI, CSF, and even testing for antineuronal autoantibodies. Now, these are costly. Uh, MRI in a private setup, almost 10,000 rupees. A standard sample, if you send for an antineuronal antibody, roughly 30,000 rupees for that. And CSF analysis, you will have to involve an anesthetist for that cost in the private setup. So things are not cheap. That's what I would like to point out over here. So don't use it indiscriminately. First of all, look clinically. Are there red flags and yellow flags? Then use this. And if you still have a doubt, take a neurological opinion. A definite diagnosis can only be done when the antibody is detected and it is compatible with the clinical syndrome. But at the same time, one should not wait for the antibody results before initiating treatment. So this is slightly paradoxical because time is of essence. And even here in India, you need to wait for a few days before you get the report of this antineuronal antibody, either the CSF or the serum. Outside India, this takes several weeks. So you can imagine one really does not have that luxury of waiting for a report before initiating the correct treatment. And I would like to emphasize again, please involve a neurologist in any suspected case. Definitely, I would say before, some people, if they are really good, after confirmation of a diagnosis of autoimmune encephalitis. So with this, let's discuss.
Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you for the very uh, comprehensive presentation, sir. And this also helps us to widen our perspectives on the differential diagnoses when coming across a patient with what may, we may think as purely psychosis. But now after the warning signs that we have come to know, it will increase our index of uh, suspicion and therefore uh, recovery. Uh, so anyone who has any questions, please type them in the chat box. Uh, until then, sir, you had mentioned that there's a difference between the adults and children in uh, clinical features, and you had said that. Uh, okay. Thank, thank you, Dr. Karishma. Uh, yes, sir. Well, I deliberately planted this question, I can say. <laughs> Because if I was to talk during that slide, it will be a lot of information. So I wanted to yes. take it out and I don't have a slide for it, but I'll explain That's it this fine. way. Yes. So you see the NMDA receptor is a ligand gated receptor, ion ligand gated receptor, and it's actually a tetrameric receptor. So what do I mean by this? Essentially, when I say ligand gated, that means there is a binding site on the uh, extracellular side for two things, a glutamate and glycine or deserine. And in the presence of a depolarization, it, there is a conformational change and the pore opens up and there is inflow mainly of calcium to an extent even of sodium and an efflux of potassium. And this calcium which goes in causes the signal transduction and second messenger cascades. So this is in a normal NMDA receptor. Now, when I say tetrameric, it means there are four heteromers over here. And there are subunits of this NMDA receptor, what we call the NR1, the NR2, and the NR3. Now, these NR1 on the outside. So usually, a tetramer composes of two NR1 and either two NR2 or NR2 and NR3. So that is how this tetramer is formed. Now, you have eight different subtypes of NR1, four different subtypes of NR2, and two different subtypes of NR3. So it's fairly complex. And each of these NR1, NR2, and NR3 are by a different gene, the GRIN, G-R-I-N gene. So GRIN1 is for NR1, et cetera. So I'm explaining the structure. Then I'm explaining that there is a difference. So when there is a fetus and a newborn, this NR2, you know, there are four I said. It's NR2, A, B, C, D. So you have two NR1 and you have two of NR2, but these two in the young children are essentially. Uh, can we stop this uh, slide sharing? Because I like to see people's faces rather than seeing this knowledge series coming. Thank you. Yeah. So I was saying there are two NR1 and there are two NR2 in the children, these are essentially NR2B and NR2D. Okay, so that is the difference. In the adults, it's NR2 of NR1 and then 2 of NR2A and C. So the subunits differ, plus the distribution of these NMD receptor is not homogeneous in the brain. So I said they're chiefly concentrated in the hippocampus and amygdala. So roughly in the brain, 30 to 40% of all the synapses are NMDA receptor synapses. But 80% of them are localized in the hippocampus and amygdala. And therefore you will have a difference when the children get it versus the adults because the subunits are different. This is what is known. It's still not known how exactly this antibody disrupts the functioning. So there are studies to show that you know, there is an alignment between the presynaptic glutamate vesicle and the postsynaptic receptor. If there's a slight shift of it, even at a nanoscale level, that disrupts the functioning. The second thing is the efferin type two interaction with the receptor. If that is disrupted because of an antibody, it disrupts the functioning. And if you actually recollect the glutamatergic hypothesis of schizophrenia. Uh, that is where the NMDA receptor uh, dysfunction is described. Yes. It's something exactly what happens in the anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis. So this is why the clinical presentation yes. has a typical primary psychosis. And 
therefore it's the you know very crucial for psychiatrists to know that a pathology like this can mimic psychosis yes absolutely so uh, so there are questions uh, which i can take so there is a question from uh, joita the other ma'am is that uh, how often have you suspected autoimmune encephalitis in your practice okay joita my practice is not that big first of all so i don't kind of dream about it in every patient but when i do see a patient specifically in that that was a real case which i presented so i had this case i think 6 7 8 months back and this gentleman had no past history so first of all 40 year old gentleman that's not a typical age of onset of first episode psychosis very abrupt onset uh, otherwise stable person with no substance use disorder and then the history was pleomorphic you know you get symptoms which don't fit into any one box so this guy when i saw he had manic symptoms he had delirium like features the family was conclusively telling me that his memory was also haywire and fortunately there was a physician who had already seen him documented neurological features so obviously this triggered the six red flags the yellow flags and i said okay let's get this done but that was also done the nmd it receptor antibody had been already sent and by the time i was there the report was available so my suspicion was already kind of proved on the same time moment you know so whenever we are having a first episode psychosis specifically look out for this clinical signs and symptoms don't straight away start doing the million dollar test because there's a tons of testing and it's it will break the bank of even a healthy financially healthy individual so think 10 times before doing the investigation but if there is even slight doubt please involve the neurologist colleague they are very well versed in this so therefore the importance today is for psychiatrists to think outside of just psychosis because the picture is very very typical of a psychiatric presentation it's only later on when the person gets getting seizures etc by then it's a little too late actually i hope that that helps joy joyta yes thank you. and since you work in the conjunction with oncologists you are more likely than anybody of us to see this patients you know because an underlying teratoma small cell lung cancers these people so even if they don't have a tumor when they are presenting the recommendation is screen for tumors even up to 7 years after this presentation because that can happen later on any more uh, questions thank you dr parker madam who mentions that it's interesting and informative lecture yes we all find it uh, very uh, informative because this widens the horizons of looking at patients another question is that if the patient is not tolerating you, antipsychotics could there be could that be an alerting symptom if we yes. have missed the red and yellow flags yes but don't just go by one symptom so just simply the fact that the person is not tolerating an antiepileptic or sorry a neuroleptic shouldn't be a red flag by itself because technically that's a yellow flag okay so you need to look at a does this person have any seizures so you have the epileptic seizure or the facio brachial dystonic seizure which is technically not a seizure is there any csf abnormalities which is there in this individual and then are there other red flags which are present before jumping on to the conclusion at least get an eeg done in this case and an mri and think of the csf because between the three the csf is the most likely to have an abnormality so mind you a normal eeg does not exclude autoimmune encephalitis and if still there is a doubt send a csf and serum sample for antibody screening autoimmune panel as they call it so metropolis is one which does it but the cost is prohibitive almost 30000 rupees for it and they don't test each and every antibody so the common ones are tested and 
even if that comes negative, if there's still a clinical suspicion, you can still think of autoimmune encephalitis. You can have an antibody negative, but this is strictly not the domain of psychiatrists. That is what I would like to emphasize again over here. Okay, also ma'am uh, mentions, uh, uh, thank you for the comprehensive and uh, clear lecture. Um, Thank you, ma'am. Another question by uh, Dhwani uh, is, Dr. Dhwani, is that tetrabenazine versus dopamine antagonist? So if there's a movement disorder related to autoimmune encephalitis, then where, where does tetrabenazine stand against dopamine antagonist? Okay, tetrabenazine per se is used when there's a tardive dyskinesia. Tardive. But we would not be using tetrabenazine in dyskinesia that are acute. Right. That is the first right. point. And secondly, if this, this kind of are happening, then one could think of giving an anti epileptic. That's point one, a benzodiazepine. Okay. But under the cover of an immunotherapy. And of course, the offending agent needs to be either reduced or changed. So usually, one would get this, this kinase as, as part of the autoimmune encephalitis or as a result of side effect of the neuroleptic, specifically yes. before, given, before giving the immunotherapy. Yes. yes. And once Thank the you, immunotherapy sir. is given, you will see that this picture improves. Um, Dr. Parker, madam, also mentions that all patients with clinical phenotypes will have known autoantibodies. Please repeat that question that all patients with clinical phenotypes hmm? will have known autoantibodies? Uh, well, the clinical phenotypes are just getting uh, descript described, but it's not necessary that there will be an autoantibody found in each one of them. It's not, some of them are yet to be found, some may not be found. So when I said antibody negative autoimmune encephalitis, mm -hmm. a little bit more details on this point, so technically, we are looking at CSF, but there may be a chance the titer of this antibody is not that high. So it's not still in the CSF, but it is hypothesized that the brain may be an immunoprecipitant reacting to this much before it comes in the CSF. So, you know, ideally a live immunostaining of the neurons would be able to give a diagnosis, but that will be a very invasive procedure. Thank you, sir. So another question is, uh, in your experience during this COVID time, uh, have you seen a decline or surge uh, of patients with autoimmune encephalitis? Very good question. So unlike people working in the government sector, I'm not involved in managing COVID patients, but I can tell you literature. So not in my experience, uh -huh. Uh -huh. but there is a literature on this in Frontiers in Psychiatry, the September 2021 issue where they have described post-COVID cases mm -hmm. coming up with autoimmune encephalitis triggered by the SARS-CoV-2 mm -hmm. virus. Mm -hmm. So it has been described and molecular mimicry is one of the mechanisms by which it can happen. So even in this SARS-CoV-2 virus, there is a description of people presenting with autoimmune encephalitis. We already know that post-COVID people are landing up with Guillain-Barre syndrome. Yes. with demyelinating pathologies and now if you this is an open access article just go to frontier psychiatry september 21 and type for this and if you all want i have this i can share it with you all if you send me uh, i don't know how but it's possible so it's it's described okay sir okay um, sir also any experience with post vaccine autoimmune encephalitis no, I, I, I don't have absolutely no experience with this. Literature describes uh, not encephalitis, but some demyelinating pathologies. But okay. I am not the right person to answer this, nor do I have any experience in this domain. Okay, okay so I'll just see, see if there are any other questions. Anybody in the audience? It's a small audience now, towards then. Any experiences that you want to share? Uh, 
Okay. Any other questions if anyone has? Because uh, this is a topic that uh, is masquerading as psychosis. So uh, to unmask it, I think, so this lecture was very useful for us. Uh, thank you so much from uh, the PG lectures team. Uh, you really helped us to widen our horizons of clinical suspicions and uh, and also and therefore improve not only the symptoms but also recovery and prognosis in the uh, long term. So yes. I thank you very much, sir. Thank uh, you. I, thank you, sir. I hand over to the team. I think uh, Dr. Avinash has already left long time back. So if there's nobody to wrap okay. up, I'd just like to thank the organizers, Dr. Rashmin Cholera also, who couldn't be here due to certain circumstances. And of course, thanks to the sponsors over here, Sun Pharma for helping get the logistics going. And thank you all once very again for all the time you all have given me. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for the time. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Bye, sir. Thank you.